It is December 4th, 2014. We're in the law offices of Herman Sock Sockrider here in Shreveport, Cato Parish, Louisiana. My name is Larry Petit. I'm president of the Shreveport Bar Association, and we are about to visit with Mr. Sockrider as part of the Louisiana Bar Foundation and the Shreveport Bar Association's archive project. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are, sir? Herman Finley Sockrider, Jr. And how long have you been practicing law? 52 years. And if you could tell us uh, when you were born and where were you born? Yes, I was born on October 26, 1938 in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And uh, your parents? Uh, my parents were Julia Beatrice Davis from Oil City and my father Herman Finley Sockrider Sr. from Jennings, Louisiana. Now, did you have anybody in your family that had been a lawyer before you? No. And you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister. And what's her name? Myrna Lenora Sockrider Green. And uh, does she still live in uh, Louisiana? No. Uh, she married a, a boy in the Air Force when, when we were living in Lake Charles and Chenault Air Force Base was there. Uh, he retired at Randolph right out of San Antonio, Texas, and they, they live uh, in Universal City, which is kind of like an airbase suburb thing, and they've been there quite a few years. Now, Mr. Sucker, I want you to go back a little bit in Lake Charles. What high school uh, did you attend? I attended what was then known as Lake Charles High School. Do you want me to give you a little history on that? I do, and also the date of graduation. Okay, I graduated uh, in 1956. When I entered as a freshman, the building was brand new. The old Lake Charles High building had burned. Uh, they were painting it on the inside and somehow it caught fire. Burned to the ground. So I started out as a freshman uh, in a brand new building and was the last class to be initiated. Uh, and in those days, initiations were pretty rough. Uh, but I had a great high school career there. Let me uh, ask you, and I'm going to show you a picture, and you need to show it to the camera if you could, if you could identify just yourself and maybe a couple of people in the picture that you still uh, can remember. All right, let's see if I put it over here. That's good. He's... All right, now do I need to hold it? If you would, just hold it and point to yourself first. All right. Uh, and then I'll ask you to kind of identify. I'm who the you fella with. in the middle. This is a uh, this is oh I guess about my junior year in high school. Uh, the lady uh, on my arm was my then girlfriend and uh, first fiance. Uh, there are other people in here, uh, all of whom are still alive, uh, some other girlfriends, <laughs> you know how high school is, but, uh, you had somebody over to the left, uh, of the picture. Well, Maybe Bobby Jones right. is on the far them. left right here. Bobby ran for governor, uh, and I was on his committee and that was against Edwin Edwards. Uh, he's a stockbroker. Next to him is Sarah Quinn, his um, his present wife. Next, the next gentleman is all right. Judge Buck Clark lost his wife in a tragic accident a few years ago. This boy is her brother. Miss Lewis. Linda. Correct. Linda's brother that people would be interested in here. Let me show you, if I could, the top picture. And this is still high school. Oh, yeah. Uh, back in, in Lake Charles High, had what was known as a career day. And you we had two different parties. The the, Demo the Nationalist and the Federalist, I think. And anyway, the, we got nominated 
by those parties and we had an election and I won the office of Commissioner of Finance and Joanna Steele who's married to a lawyer a Cilio in Lake Charles okay is my secretary and was my then girlfriend and the time period again would be oh let's see this uh, this article was July 8 2011 I'm going to, before we leave Lake Charles, one other picture that I thought was uh, kind of captured the <laughs> moment. This is a little bit before high school. This yeah, is, this, is, uh, this is grammar school, summer league. Uh, the fellow in the picture is Tommy Willis. Tommy was my rear neighbor in Lake Charles, and we were best friends. We were the first little league team that Lake Charles ever had. We won every game, including the playoff, and Tommy was our star. He played second base and, and shortstop, and man, I mean, he could handle that ball, and we were just kids. You had to be under 12 to be on this team. When we won the championship, the coach protested and said, I want everybody's birth certificate except his. I, I know he in 12. And so everybody brought him and he brought his and gave it to the coach. The coach looked at it and put it in his pocket. He was the only one over the age limit <laughs> and they didn't took it. Tommy now lives in Shreveport. He spent a career here uh, in the Shreveport uh, City Police Department. And your championship still stands. It still stands. <laughs> now, Sock Rider, if you could, tell us when uh, when did you get to law school and where did you go to law school? All right, I went to law school at what was then known Louisiana State University Law School. That was its name. Uh, I, went, I began there in 2060 after four years of undergrad at LSU. All right, so 1960 is your law school entry date. That's my entry date. I graduated uh, in June of 63. My class was the first to have 12 hours added to its curriculum, which is the total number of hours that we have now. Along with that came a residency requirement that you be there for seven semesters. At the school. Right. Now, three of us in that class were not told, and I assume that neither was the rest of our class, that in order to graduate June three years later, we had to go to summer school the first summer, second and third summer, to, to get out in time. Our jobs were arranged for that, you know, when we started interviewing. Uh, our jobs that we held, like myself, I put myself through school, married with children, and, you know, all of those ended when, when, when June came. So we went to, to Dean Abair and uh, told him our plight, and he said, well, let me think about it. And he called us back in. He said, I'm going to use you all as an experiment. If, if your class who takes this short period continues to maintain the same grades you have maintained, I'm going to allow it. All three of us, one of them I remember was Buddy Kaiser out of Baton Rouge. I uh, can't remember who the third one was. But, but we all continued and we all made law review. So we got out in June, you see, because they were only going to give the bar exam once a year. And we would miss it if we had to stay in school. So that was a big boon. That, was, that helped us. In other words, you performed appropriately so the dean was of, of a mind to let you go forward. Yes. And did that change the way I don't they know did if it? it changed permanently. No one ever told me because it was something, you know, we had a little bulletin board down in the stairs. And that's where we got all our messages from the dean. Uh, 
I was of a group that, that they transferred 30 hours from your undergraduate degree into law school, and that's, that's what they call a combined degree. Correct. And so you'd get your undergraduate degree. Right, after your first uh, year. Dean Airbear called me in. If you look me up and look at my statistics, I got out of undergrad in June of 62, and I graduated from law school in June of 63. <laughs> okay, well, that's because I never looked at the bulletin board. Uh, you know, and finally Dean Aber called me and he said, do you want to graduate <laughs> from undergrad? And I said, well, yes, sir. He said, that thing's been out there for two years. Uh, you know, he fussed at me for not reading the bulletin board. All right, I'm going to uh, show you one other picture of the distant past, and then I'm going to ask you about how you got to Shreveport. But let me just ask you to identify this photograph for me. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Lake Charles High had built a memorial to those who lost their lives in World War I and World War II. I was chosen as a student in my class, and I would say this was my junior or senior year, which would have been 55 or 56, to give the speech. Is that that's your <laughs> okay. speech? Dedicating this document. And that's me on the left. I'll do that for me just a little bit. Uh, right there. There we go. And that's me at the dedication. Uh, Connie Sue DeZarmo, Eleanor Greason, Danny O'Brien, they had to be part of the committee. Um, this paper here of several pages, in fact seven, is my speech. And I had it handwritten, as you can tell, on three by five cards. And was this delivered to the city, to the school? To the school and all of the widows and orphaned children from them. And it's got the name of every decedent on it. That still stands today, even though the building is in disrepair and non-use. It's out by the flagpole. Excellent. Okay. I was very proud of that. I'll, I'll have to tell you one thing I did. I've never, I've never been timid on, on talking to somebody. And while I was giving it, I, I had my knees locked, and they gave way. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to my knees right in the middle of the ceremony, and I didn't have a relative on it. My next door neighbor's father was on it. But uh, anyway, I made it through my speech. Now, Thank bring you. me to when you graduated from LSU, and the time period we're talking about is going to be 1963. Yeah. What was your first job as a lawyer? The first job uh, that I accepted was a law clerk for Judge John T. Hood at the Third Circuit Court of Appeal in Lake Charles, my hometown. Uh, but I accepted it with a condition. I, my desire, I graduated third in my class of June, and my desire was to be a lawyer that worked with people. I didn't want to do insurance work. I. I took more oil and gas than any student there, including oil and gas taxation. I would have gone there. Uh, but all the bids I got were basically large firms in New Orleans uh, and around the place. And so not having what I wanted, uh, I said, and they said, well, Judge Clark, I mean, Judge Hood still hadn't filled his vacancy. So I took that with the caveat that if I found an opening in a people firm, I could leave at mid-semester if I could find him an order of the coif replacement. I, 
I was made an offer by Booth Lockard. I came and took that job. And I got Graydon Kitchens, who retired recently as a district judge, well, not recently, uh, out of Webster Parish. Um, and he replaced me with Judge Hood. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I've talked to Judge Kitchens about that, and he said that that's what happened. And then he later went from Judge Hood to Judge Dawkins. Yeah, here, here was the way that locked up. He already had a job with Judge Dawkins. After Sidney Nelson finished his clerkship there, and as you know, they are very, very close friends. Still today. Uh, today. And so Graydon had a void there waiting for Sidney to finish clerking, and uh, he, he just moved right over there and took right up where I had left off and, and let me come here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that firm you came with. Okay. You, uh, as you know, there is a, uh, a picture that has each of the uh, partners, I think, at the time you came, right? Yes. This, this is, I was the youngest, most recent addition to the firm in this photo. And we're talking about 1964, you think? No, um, I came there in February 1 of 1964. And what did you come to do? What were you hired? If, if you were hired for a particular type of practice, what was no, it? No, uh, they, they and the Gainsburg firm out of Orleans were the two largest plaintiff type firms. They did other general type practices, but on the personal injury side, they were on the plaintiff side. Um, they did other work uh, and they represented what was then Shreveport Bank. They represented the Caddo Parish School Board. Um, and I would say just about anything walked in the door that was on the plaintiff's side, except for those items, uh, someone in that law firm handled it. And tell us who was in the law firm when you came. Okay. And we're, we're going to zoom Here, in a little bit. Can you see it? You need to know who's who. Go ahead and tell us. All right, I'm going to try to look at it from the other side. Harry V. Booth is in the middle. Leonard L. Lockard is to my right, his left, it's on the telephone. Whitfield Jack is here. John Pleasant is up in the top right here. Uh, Joe LaSage is right here on the phone. Uh, Jim Thornton down at the bottom middle and Henry Polites at the top came in about the same time. Uh, Jim Reeder over here to my right was three years ahead of me. And this is me down in the far corner right. here. Let's hold with that. Just to keep, we're going to keep it on that picture for just a minute. And and that's that's always there. We we added some more through the years, but this this is what it was composed of when I got there. Now, who mentored you among the group uh, that you're holding? And I've got to your uh, right hand is a picture, so you can see them a little bit better. Who was the mentor or mentors for you out of the firm? Well. Jim Thornton taught me a lot. He was a scholar. He was very bright, and he wrote as well as anyone I've ever seen. He just had had a gift. Um, he actually published some books, I believe. Yes, he did. Uh, he and he's deceased now. Um, his his buddy was John Pleasant, but Jim Thornton had the luxury. They'd want him to write a brief, for example. He spent three weeks on it and do nothing else. I mean, he was a, he was a one-file guy, but he always was successful. You know, he was just brilliant. Now, was he friends with Bennett Johnson? There was a, who was the friend when? Well, I'll tell this story. 
Benny Johnson called me and wanted me to join his firm when he got elected senator. Jim Rader wanted it. He didn't ask Jim. Time grew on and all of a sudden uh, um, let me see here. Yeah. Thornton announces the firm that he's going over and practice with the senator's father, who was elderly. And Jim practiced, you know, there on his own and, until he died. Uh, he and Hank Polites weren't particularly good friends. <laughs> okay, they clashed, and believe it or not, it was over religion. You know, Hank was a very, very devout Catholic. Correct. And uh, I forget which Protestant church Jim did, but you know, he he they quals. They squabbled over whether the Catholic Church was the only true church. <laughs> you know, and, and I was friends with both of them. Now, besides Jim Thornton, um, Mr. Booth would have me follow him around. Uh, he would accompany me to trials to tell me what I did right or wrong. And... Mr. Lockard was just a lifetime companion. He he came in one day. You might want to edit this out. <laughs> and I had a very difficult case, a criminal case, going to trial. And I was pacing the window. And he and I were always the two early risers. And he came in and he said, well, what's up, Sock? And I said, well, you know, I got a jury trial and so-and-so over so-and-so today. Mr. Lockett, my man's guilty. And I told him, well, you don't have to testify. He said, oh, yes, I do. And I said, well, you can't lie. He said, yes, I can. And I said, I just don't know what to do. You know, I've, I've never been faced with that ethical problem. And I was just going to sit him at my side and keep a muzzle on him. He chewed a cigar. He never smoked it. This is Mr. Lockard? Yeah. And he leaned back in the chair in front of my desk and he said, Sock, in this legal world, every now and then, you've got to gut up to it and make a moral decision. I said, I have. He said, and lie. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughed at me and said, no, don't do that. You do what your conscience says. And I talked him into not testifying, and he was found not guilty. That doesn't always happen, but it does happen. Now, you kind of segued into something I wanted to ask you about. In the firm that uh, you were starting your practice here in Shreveport, Judge Polis went on to become, well, Henry Polis went on to become a Fifth Circuit and Chief of the Fifth Circuit. That's correct. In a judgeship. And as you know, there's an inn of court here in Shreveport. It is called the Harry V. Booth, Henry A. Pulley's inn of court. And both of the lawyers come out of the firm in which you started your, I guess, career here in Shreveport, correct? Right. And when did you, uh, you formed your own firm when? I formed my own firm in February of 1979 when, when, when Hank Pulley's was appointed by Carter, President Carter, he came to me and he said, you know, I know you're on the edge of going out on your own. He said, is that true again this year? <laughs> and I just always had the urge. And I said, yes. He said, well, don't do it until I find out if I'm accepted. Uh -huh. And he said, if I am, you know, of course, do your thing. But if I'm not, I'll go with you. And I said, I don't believe you. You know, this was Mr. Harry's firm. And he and Mr. Harry Booth were very, very close. Uh, well, as you know, his appointment got confirmed by the Senate. And I told him, I'm out of here. 
He said, well, stay till I leave. And I said, well, it's the beginning of a fiscal year. February 1 was the beginning, end of their, starting of their new fiscal year. And I said, just from a bookkeeping standpoint, you know, all the books will be done, let's do it that way. And so I went to Jim Bolin, who was, uh, who he'd been with us, I don't know, five or six years. Uh, he was a partner. And I went to him and I said, uh, Jim, this time I'm really moving, <laughs> you know, and I'm going to form my own law firm. I, I have about twice what I can handle, and I, and I would choose you if you would accept it to come over and be a partner with me. And uh, you got plenty of work to do. And I said, first year it will be 45, 55. Hmm? Second year, it'll be 50-50. What do you say? He said, let's go. <laughs> he take his time to think about it or do anything else. And we've been together ever since 79. So your firm has been continuous since 79 till today and primarily now in the domestic practice? Well, that is true with all but Jim Bolin. He has a personal injury succession practice. Um, but Rex Anglin and Greg Batt and I do primarily, I'd say 95%, uh, domestic. Now, back at the time when you were making that decision to start your own firm, I was curious a little bit, the judges, who were some of the judges in Caddo that you would be appearing in front of? Because your practice took you into court. Ooh, you moved lot. me 17 years. I'm going back. I'm going I, back. I was thinking you were going to ask me when I started practicing Well, let's here. start with that. Uh, on the district bench, uh, I remember Pops Turner, um, Bill Flanagan, uh, I'm not sure how quick Jack Fant came on board, but Jack, Jack came on board for a while. His father uh, had been the mayor. Dad, his dad was mayor, and he was my, he was my counselor at Boys State, Jack was. Uh, let's see, who else was in the district court? Did I name Flanagan? Flan you did, and then we both Flanagan Turner. Uh, there was a judge, uh, uh, Middleton, that came over from city court. Uh, Neil Bolin. I was going to ask if Judge Bolin had gotten in yet. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where he got in there, but... Uh, he, he, he was a tough judge. He, and, and, he was difficult. And served for a long time yeah. here in Caddo. But also, you've already mentioned that uh, it was Judge Dawkins, Jr. Federal. In the federal. And my question next was going to be, the lawyer or lawyers that you would often see, because I know you were in court a lot. Who, I was. Who were some of the lawyers on the other side at the time that you were starting to practice and getting into uh, the time well, that you departed? Some of the lawyer. big horses, I call them, were Jim Bodenheimer. Uh, Charles and Paul Meyer, Alex Smith, uh, Ben King, uh, let me think of that, uh, Billy Pesnell. Mm -hmm. Did you deal with Wilton Williams at all? Who? Wilton Williams. Oh, oh yeah, Wilton Williams. Uh, now you talk about a good lawyer. Milton was re Wilton was really a good lawyer. He beat me in two cases that I remember. Well, I say beat me. He won. And Charles Gladney was an associate under him, and he he got the opinion on motion hour, and he walked over to uh, Milton and. Uh, whispered in his ear, he was trying a case, and, and we went, and Wilton went like, <laughs> you know. He was surprised. He was surprised, but I ran home and, you know, told Locker and them uh, about all that. He said, how much money did you make? <laughs> I mean, you know, you're all excited about this case for what Milton did, but I just, I just thought it was, you know. It was, uh, in those days, I know there wasn't air conditioning, so sometimes, and what I'm talking about when you first started, as I recall, they didn't have summer 
uh, sessions all the way through? I'm trying to think of when that started. They rotated the judges. You said air conditioning? There was a time I was told there wasn't air conditioning, so they didn't have court during the summer. And even when I started practicing, they had a very light summer docket. We, yeah, summer court pretty well shut down, except for uncontested matters and defaults. Um, you could smoke in court, and that's because the judges smoked. D. Alexander was one of them, uh, and you know, I mean, you'd walk in the courtroom and you got five or six lawyers there and the staff and all the judges. I mean, you, it's you a can, haze, huh? Yeah, and I was one of them. Uh, I was a very heavy smoker until August, well, until 1983, and uh, I went with the bar association to Paris. And that was what a ten-hour flight or whatever it was, and people sitting around me didn't want me smoking for ten hours, and I quit. Yep. I never picked up another one. Never, don't really care about them. I want to talk a little bit about the, the bar association. All right. And I know that uh, there was a time that you started off being active in the state bar. Right. So uh, you were president of the Young Lawyers. Uh, kind of like to start with that. Yes. You were president of the Young Lawyers section of the Louisiana State Bar when? When would that have been? It's on that plaque. It's before I was 36. Uh, I've got 1974 to 1975. Okay. That's when I was president of, of the Young Lawyers section of the S Louisiana State Bar Association. And you continued in leadership capacities culminating in what I'd like you now to show us. You were president of the Louisiana State Bar Association. That's correct. And that would be, is it 1992? 92 slash 93. If you could... Uh, Let's see, this is an... I'll hold it up in a minute. This is August 1992. There is a tradition that lasts still today that the issue that comes out after you've been chosen and sworn into office, that the cover uh, has your picture on it. And that's what this is. In 1992-93, and I'm looking at a plaque, as you hold that up, I want you to keep it up. There are a lot of uh, plaques that we could talk about today, but the one I'm looking at to my right is from Harry Harden, and it is an appreciation of your year, and it says a very successful year due to the leadership of his president, Mr. Herman Sockrider, Jr., 19, June 11, 1993, in Destin, Florida. A little bit, what, if any, uh, I guess, thoughts do you have now today about the Louisiana State Bar when you were president as, as compared to today? Well, it seems to be a full-time job. I have to give a little bit of history, if you don't mind. Sure. The way you got elected was a person from each congressional district was voted on as your nominator. So this year it was Herschel Richard. But for example, Alex Smith in Lake Charles. I don't know if you know him, but mm -hmm. he, he was a classmate of mine, uh, a fraternity brother of mine at LSU. But anyway, um, they would, and what I would do is I would call these different people that had persuasion in their district who had previously nominated somebody or spoken in their behalf. Alex was one in Lake Charles. Uh, and you would ask them if they would please vote for you for president-elect. There was an, if you won that, there was an automatic elevation to president the next year. And that year after that, you were still on the Board of Governors. It actually covered a four-year dedication. Because I've always been an hourly, most, mostly, and an hourly rate lawyer, I went to my then partners 
and said, look, I, I, I'm going to, I'd like to run. I think I'm going to win. And I think I'm going to be out of the office half the time. I will, you know me well, I will work on the weekends, et cetera, and I'll try to keep up as best I can. You even have a private office in New Orleans and a parking space. You know, I mean, they, they need you there. Six hours from here, though. So we've got it set up for X years from now. Well, I was a bar junkie. I was a member of the Board of Governors, and I was a member of the House of Delegates. I'd been doing, you know, young lawyer, president, and all that. I was perched and ready to take over in two years. The lawyer in front of me got sued for malpractice, for letting prescription run on a claim. They took his deposition and he denied that he did it. And the record clearly showed what day it was filed and what the period was. So he's out of the rotation. The Bar Association was concerned that that black eye might hurt the image and the New Orleans Times Picayune had gotten on us before. So he was asked to resign. That became a contested issue, okay? His lawyer appeared at the meeting, but it ended up being settled, and they said, Sock, you're the ultimate bar junkie, <laughs> and this will give you a year's rest. Will you come in a year early? And I was happy to do that. And, of course, I had to move everything around in the office to do it. So I served one year less than prior and future presidents. Uh, who were in the lockstep to be yeah, president of the bar. I understand. Yeah. And uh, that that was traumatic for that lawyer, very traumatic. Well, what about when you were uh, president of the bar, and uh, again, New Orleans is six hours from here, were you able to balance the practice? Because you had a busy practice. I know a busy trial practice I did. at the time. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, I kept my, my nose above the water. And I, I, that's my... That's my personality. And, and though my law partner didn't say it, they knew <laughs> just because I wasn't going to neglect clients that I would work on clients' files and that would reduce money. And there was very little difference in production. You were able to do it, in other words. I was able to do it. Good year. Now, looking back on your bar presidency, and again, there are some plaques here uh, congratulating you on your outstanding performance. Is there anything, I'm still a little curious as to the way it is today and the way it was when you were the bar president, uh, any thoughts about things that you did that you felt were a program or a platform that you had? That well, I was charged with one primary obligation. The Bar Association's dues were less than Shreveport Bar dues. I don't remember the exact figure, but I think something like $50 a year. <laughs> and we had a $3 million budget, you know. So it was my job, along with Loretta Larson, <coughs> excuse me, who still is the executive director. We traveled the state. I mean, we went to Podunk. <laughs> we went everywhere with a dog and pony show charts and what we needed and what we did and the only other president of the bar that had ever tried it was a very popular lawyer in Baton Rouge and they voted his down and and I mean there was a resounding vote against it I never have figured that out you know I mean I went all over the state talking to him at lunch you know those sort of things and I had all my charts and all that stuff. And, you know, basic was, we love you, Sock, but we're not going to pay any more dues. It did get you around, though. Out it got me about. around. I got to know a lot, a lot of people. Uh, now, I don't know. I have to be honest with you. I haven't kept up with the state bar work since they wore me out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not very long. Uh, I think that each president kind of comes up with his own primary objectivity. Uh, of course, the Board of Governors 
can direct him in what he does. But um, I don't, I, I really think this, that job is not necessarily a popularity contest. Oh, I know Sock, I like him. No, it's Sock will do a good job. And I think that's the way all the presidents have gotten in, is they, they've been around as a bar junkie, they've worked their way up into that office, and I think they command the respect of their board and of the House of Delegates. But uh, And this year, it doesn't happen often, there's only been a few, but this year we do have a Louisiana State Bar President from the Shreveport Bar being Larry Shea. Yeah. And so there's only been, a, I can count on my hands, the number of Bar Presidents we've had from Shreveport, Louisiana. You, of course, being one of them. I wanted to um, talk now a little bit about your activities also, though, here in the Shreveport Bar. And I'm going to talk about Justinian. You are in a lot of things still, but you also, as I recall, had and keep a lot of contact with the crew of Justinian here in our Shreveport Bar. Were you uh, royalty or were you reigning at one point in time? Okay, I was King Six. I think that number is right, of the crew of Justinian. Uh, and I was a member of Justinian for a very long time. Um, I always have to ask my wife, you want to go to everything? <laughs> you know, we're getting to an age where we're kind of settled in. Uh, but if you'll remember, there's uh, a five-year commitment if you accept, I, I think, not only King, but uh, uh, who's the real workhorse? Well, the, the captain. The captain. Uh, the king was window dressing. <laughs> okay. The captain is the workhorse. If they don't know it, I'll say it. The captain is the workhorse of our crew. And he accepts volunteers and he nominates and, you know, to do the float, float lieutenants and things of that sort. And, and the social functions, it is a, it's a great entity to belong to. In your firm, I know you've had captains. Greg Bat's been a captain. Jim Bowl and his wife have also been royalty. Your right. firm's been very supportive of the crew of Justinian, right. which is, as you'll recall, it was started to be the fundraising arm for the Shreveport Bar Association so that they could maintain an executive director. And it's flourished to being one of the biggest crews, I think now, in the Arthitex. Oh, I think that's right. And I'm still on the board that elects king and queens, you know, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, now, that is, that's not only a popularity contest, but it's, they pick worker bees, you know, ladies that have really worked hard in the past in the crew, and gentlemen too. And the captain is always a worker bee. I'll tell you one thing about it. Jim Fortson and I, for years, have been common opponents in the domestic field. The big check we got. He was initially in that case. He didn't end up with it, but he initially was. And when he joined the crew way back there, he was heard to say, you know, I've always found Sock hard to take. But I joined the crew and I saw another side of him. And he's a neat guy. <laughs> and, and I think that's just an example how two war horses, you know, uh, realize that their opponents are just human. Right. And the crew of Justinian has been the facilitator for a lot of attorneys who were yes. opposed to get together. I want to ask you a little bit more and then we're going to talk about a couple of cases you've had. If you could show that to us, I just want to... You want the golf picture? I think so, because again, every year there is a golf tournament that it initially was to raise money for the Legal Services Corporation, right. but now it's segued into a fundraiser, a major fundraiser for the Shreveport Bar to you know, have an operating budget, and you guys participate and win it, apparently, often. Well, we've done well in it. Uh, this photo... Who's in Let it? me get my glasses back on. Okay. Starting here, that's my present wife. I don't think we were married at this time. What's the year? 1990. 
that we married in 1993. Okay, that's me next to her. That's her son, Scott, who was next, next to me. And on the end, Mona McLaren, one of my paralegals. Mona's deceased. She died of cancer. She worked for you for a long time, though, as I recall. 20 years. One of the best paralegals I've ever had. Um, and Scott worked in the Scott, crew of Justinian. Scott was very, very involved. He built two of the floats from ground up in a, in a vacant lot he owned next to it. And members of the crew came out there and helped us work on it. Scott died of a liver failure. Uh, let's see, in January, I think it'll be two years. Okay. We miss him very much. He, uh, his, his father was the predeceased. And I, I really kind of became his father, you know, and always had been. But this is in 1990. And we've got several golfing pictures, but you, uh, your wife, Katie, you all had played golf recreationally. Oh, yeah, we played for years. We, uh, I can't swing anymore. Rex Anglin, my partner, also played in this with his wife, Barbara. Barbara was a Eastridge female champion. Y'all did well. <laughs> I want to ask you a couple of questions about a case or so that um, I know you have a, a number of cases, a number of very, we looked earlier, very satisfied clients who've written you nice notes about your legal abilities and your professionalism. But uh, I want to start with this case. Uh, just this, no, no names that you would be uncomfortable with, but just tell us a little bit about how this sets up because you've got a very nice note there. Let me say this. I, I don't know about lawyers in your field or others, but in in the domestic field, it is just an absolute rarity to get a thank you. We always say that a good compromise is one in which both sides are equally dissatisfied. Uh, there are no winners. There really aren't, you know. Sometimes the client thinks he won, but maybe the kids lost. <laughs> you know, I was trying one here a while back, and I was winning. And I told my client, you're getting ready to get the booby prize. Are you sure you want it? <laughs> you're winning. <coughs> or do you want to approach a settlement? And we settled it. He said he didn't want the booby prize. Now this one. This one has a nice history. You can see that it has a name on it. I'm going to leave that last name off. This client had an invalid prenup agreement. And it was going in her favor. She didn't have a valid one. Her yeah, husband did not it, do it correctly. Her husband was worth millions of dollars. And so he did a prenup, but he... They did it wrong. So they've got a community. And I think I've got a gut sense on the facts. I've even got her former husband's deposition. <laughs> it's, it's locked. Well, by the time we got to court, Fortson wasn't handling it. Uh, Lynn Walker was. Uh, I get along with Lynn Lock Walker. There are, there are lawyers who complain about her, but I don't. I mean, she just does her lawyering, you know, and a good job. Well, anyway, she's representing him when we go to court. And the issue is, is that a valid or an invalid prenup? And the judge had been telling us all along we were going to win. And you but got the wife. I got the wife. And I, I think I'm just over there to walk walk through a cake, cakewalk. And uh, he rules against me. I was shocked. The defendant husband, worth lots of money, huh, was shocked. He was prepared to write a check. Within about two or three days, I prepared a motion for appeal. And I prepared my appellate brief. Okay. And I sent them to 
Lynn Walker. She called me up and she said, how much do you want? I said, I want him to make the first offer. I figured the community was about X dollars and he owed her half and that's the figure I gave her. We drew up the papers. I told her to bring a certified check or a bank money order for that kind of money in the seven figures. We went over there and the judge didn't know what we were doing there. He waited till after five to finish up his case. We're sitting there and what can I do for y'all? And we tell him and he said, you did. Back to the trial judge then. Yeah, back to the trial judge, just days. Not even a week. And you could tell he was shocked. So the defendant, who was 80 some odd years old, my client in her 60s, wrote her a personal check after five. Uh, I got the document signed and I got hand delivered the check, but the banks are closed. And I don't like it, it's personal. The next morning about 9.30, my client calls me and says they can't find my husband. I said, what does that mean? She said, I don't know. Did you see him last night? No. Well, in about an hour or two, they found him floating in Cross Lake. He had had a massive heart attack, no water in his lungs, and feeding his ducks on his pier. Killed over with a heart attack. So. You got a check. I got a check. We go to the bank. Hmm? And I tell the bank the, the situation, and I said, can I negotiate it? And they said, does he have a lawyer succession? Well, Bob Pugh had called me saying, you know, I'm on. So I called Bob, and I said, what do we, you know, can I cash it or, or what? He said, yeah, go ahead. So we come over here, and I put her fee money in my trust account and, and would charge against it as we did work. And there was some left in it. So she came over and we, we straightened that out. And I told her how pleased I was, you know, and everything like that. And she said, what's the biggest fee you ever got? <laughs> I said, why? And she told me she wanted to give me a bonus. Well, you can't just accept that. You have to go through getting approval for going beyond that, which we did. And I called my partners in and, you know, what, and told her what she was trying to do and that I didn't think we could do it. And they said, oh, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did. And without disclosing any amounts, it's the largest fee I've ever earned. Now, and she uh, also had, in addition to being very pleased and financially very rewarding for you, the same client has a scholarship in your name added LSU. That was another surprise. Uh, I, I don't know how many thousands of dollars she put in it, but she she started uh, a fellowship in my name and uh she um she solicited some benefic mm -hmm. no some potential donors she never did tell me who they were uh they presented me with a plaque with my wife and with Earlene and uh the president chancellor of LSUS and uh, well, we have a picture, if we could. Do you, you wish? I think this is the ceremony. Yes. And that's Earlene in there uh, on my arm. This is Earlene. And uh, these are other, other lawyers and dignitaries around. Can you get it? We can see it fine. Congratulations yeah. on that. Well, she's, you, a, she's a real sweetheart. <laughs> over the years, I know you've got, and we talked about it earlier, a um, number of cases of interest that we could talk about, but I want to move a little bit into uh, a couple of personal questions for you. You have uh, how many children? I have four sons. Go ahead and tell us their names and ages. Okay. Keith is, uh, was born in 1960. He lives on my property. Um, and he's an electrician, uh, retired U.S. Navy. Steve is 52. 
He lives in Boca Raton, Florida, where he has custody of his two sons, 15 and 12. He has a job for a Dallas-based real estate, commercial real estate, And they put together what he calls deals. Deals, yeah. You know, they buy land and they build a shopping center on it and stuff like that. Well, he's the go-between between the owner and the purchaser. And uh, he had a massive heart attack two years ago, and we thought we were going to lose him. But he came back. He had triple bypass at age 50. And he's doing fine now, but uh, he gave us a real scare two years ago. Number three son is Gary. Uh, Gary was born in 1965. He is a computer guru. I asked him, he was here for Thanksgiving. He's married and has a daughter and a son. And by the way, out of my eight grandchildren, mind you, I had four boys. My four boys had seven boys and one girl. Okay, so we're pretty much boy makers. Uh, never really understood that. You got the pattern right there in front of you. Okay. It should be 50 50, but it's not uh, in your case. You would think. All right. Uh, All right, so Gary's. Let's good. see. Gary, uh, Gary represents an international firm, and he, he's called an engineer. But he, his territory includes all of North America, all of South America, and part of Europe. And they have him go around as a keynote speaker all over the country to explain what he does and what his company does. Then there's Chris, um, who is a board-certified breast cancer surgeon, has one partner here in Shreveport, and he has four sons, <laughs> okay, uh, ages uh, 14 to 8, okay, another good Catholic family. His wife is an OBGYN specialist here in Shreveport. That's my young ones. That's your oh, youngest. look, if you turn around, there's a picture, picture on the wall. It's all of my children and grandchildren and my present wife. All right, and the sons, and I'll bring the picture over. The sons that you have is with your wife, your first wife, Ellie, right? Right. Okay, and then this picture, if you could share it with us a little bit. Yeah. Has your group. You want me to identify them? Well, you can just start with uh, boys. All right. Well, see, this is my present wife, and we have no children together. This is my oldest son, Keith. This is the next one in line, Steve. Okay, go up me. This is my wife here. Okay, my present wife. Uh, this is my son, Gary, in Colorado. And this is my son, the doctor in Shreveport. Now... This is Gary's wife, Chris, Chris's wife. Where's Greg's wife? You around here somewhere? Here, yeah. yeah. This is his wife. Here's Steve. Oh goodness! All these grandchildren. This is my. This is my 14-year-old. And let me look at my other one. Anyway, they're all in there. Right. There's Gary. You, you can, some of them you can really tell that this one put his stamp on him. <laughs> you know. But anyway, I'm very proud of that. The last, and we are going to keep it within our time period. I've got one last question for you. We'll do it at the end. And this is, to me, it's a colorful story. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, ask you to tell it briefly in the, in a minute's time. <laughs> you related it to me when we had our archives project, and I'll set it up. You're a K. You're at LSU. And you get the date of the century. Okay. Uh, uh, during uh, 
my undergraduate years, I'm going to say sophomore, which would be about 1958. The, the world-renowned stripper, Candy Bar, and that's C-A-N-D-Y-B-A-R-R, -R, appeared across the river in the Port Allen area from Baton Rouge. Those of my age at that time were familiar with the fact that she had made some pornographic films. Okay? And you know how fraternity boys can be. They said, somebody needs to bring her to dinner on date day. But don't tell Mom Ludlam, the house mother. So you got to know I'm in the middle of that. They tell me I'm designated to, as vice president. John, John Swab, president, wouldn't go. So I was pledge trainer, too. So they wanted me to go get her. So we went over and watched her do her dance and strip job. And when it got to intermission, I went backstage, asked for her manager, and she and her manager came to talk to me. And I said, you know, some real good advertisement would be you come into the KA house for, for lunch. Oh, I'd love that, you know. So we arranged one of our... Um, Members had a convertible, and we arranged for him to go pick her up, okay? He did, boy, and the streets were lined. We set her down at Mom Ludlin's table, and Mom got up and went in the room. But at any rate, after dinner was over, I decided to present her with a KA locket that was 14 karat gold with pearl in it and had our emblem. It was, it was uh, our, our gift for the Old South Ball. Of course, I did that as vice president. And as I hung it around her neck, it fell into the cleavage, and she kissed me, and the light went off. Lo and behold, you know, it was the Reveille camera. So now it's all over the campus, and they also sent it to the New York Times. All right, Dean French calls in, me in, as being responsible because I'm in the picture, and says he's going to put us on probation, and... All kind of stuff. Leroy Scott, province commander of the whole state, a lawyer here in Shreveport, uh, came to my defense and uh, attorney defense, and no action was taken against us. Uh, some years later, uh, two local lawyers here, one Leroy Scott and the other Roland Ashe, heard that Candy Bar was uh, stripping at the Stark Club in the old Bosch Strip. And they called my house and wanted me to take them and introduce them because I had become familiar with her. And uh, I refused because I was happily married to the girl that was angry at me uh, previously. Can Speaking of the New York Times, sure. Candy Bar died at age 70. Okay. And the New York Times ran that on January 4, 2006, I looked for my name, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and anyway, it's, it says, Candy Bar 70, stripper and star of 50s Stags film dies. Okay. Now, uh, there's only one Stag film that I ever saw. She claimed she was on drugs at the time she did it. You know, she was, she was, is it Mickey Cohen, the gangster? She was his mistress for some years. So in this, again, you were never one to turn down a challenge. And in addition to going and bringing her as the date or the guest for yeah. the K Wednesday night a meal at the house, you have been president or an officer, it looks like, in just about every organization that you've been affiliated with from the legal back to... Uh, I guess elementary school. That's true. Uh, I think the only organization that I haven't been president of is your current office, the president of the Shreveport Bar. And after I got through being president of the Young Lawyers section of the Shreveport Bar, I turned my efforts to the statewide organization. We have uh, 
enjoyed the visit. I will tell you it's been entertaining, obviously, even just to visit with you as we were talking about what we wanted to talk about. On the video, you've got a large number of awards in the office here, a lot of very interesting stories and cases. What I want to end with is you've been an active trial lawyer for a long time here in Caddo Parish. 52, 52, 52 years. years. And I think this is an excellent bar, and we're proud of you and uh, your leadership you. in the state bar as well. But thank you very much for visiting with us. Thank you. Off the camera. We're off.